Welcome to class today, Psychology of Gender. We really have them packed in here today, students coming from all over the city for this wonderful class. We are uh, uh, taping this class today without the regular class that's here, so um, you get to hear me speak, and maybe I'll ask some questions of myself, but um, had a little transition here at the university, but we wanted to keep on going with the uh, class to get it, uh, uh, to help you students who are watching it, to keep it going. and. Um, our next class, we'll have all the students back for our next series. But uh, since we have a, an exam coming up in uh, about two more classes, in other words, the next class after this one, we'll review what's going to be on the exam. And uh, to uh, lower any anxiety out there, that of course the exam will be on material we've covered and material from the books, uh, the chapters and the two little books. So there's no trick questions. Um, my preference uh, as, a, uh, as a professor really uh, uh, in terms of exams originates in my work as a psychologist. I'm a psychologist in private practice who's an adjunct professor over here. And I want you to learn this stuff. I want you to, uh, for your minds to be quickened, for you to have some new ideas and maybe some uh, new concepts of yourself and understanding gender, understanding your own gender identity issues. Uh, I hope this class uh, helps you grow as a person and uh, helps you understand uh, more about what it means uh, to be masculine and feminine, male, female, and perhaps uh, uh, become a larger person because you took this course. So what I do on the exams is the exams are also learning experiences. I'm not going to ask you trick questions. I'm going to ask you questions that I think that I want you to learn out of the course. So, um, uh, so relax and uh, you'll, you'll do fine with the exam if you know the material and if you've uh, attended to the lectures and stuff. So today uh, we are continuing on sort of putting an ego together and understanding gender identity. Uh, before we jump into this, uh, let me make a couple of suggestions of ways you can get extra credit, which you need to mail in or email in to uh, my email office, uh, my email site. Um, address which you can get uh, but I always like students to do extra credit related to the topic we're teaching uh, I'm teaching and on gender uh, I went and saw Chocolat the movie for the fifth time <laughs> this last weekend and uh, what a what a fantastic movie in term one, one aspect of it is looking at the gender issues the way women are treated in the are sort of archaic medieval uh, religious world of the little village, uh, the way the uh, protagonist, Juliette Binoche, uh, asserts herself uh, in the midst of having grace and beauty and tolerance and understanding these aspects of the divine feminine, as it were, uh, and yet she uh, has integrated her masculine quite well. She doesn't, she's not pushed around. She uh, seems to have a sense of direction and and humility and is willing to grow and change and take risk and anyway she's she comes across as a very uh, model of a uh, of sort of a whole person and but in looking at the issues of gender and the abuse of women in the movie and how they come to terms with it and how these women support each other and uh, anyway uh, it's a great movie to go see to just look at gender issues public policy religious policy how we tend to fall into roles and uh, movies full of this these uh, <clears throat> issues of gender identity and how particularly how women are, are treated in, uh, in the patriarchal society so go see the movie read it uh, and you know write page page and a half about some of these issues that you see from our text and lectures that come out there and what it means to you uh, another movie I saw just the other day is called the circle which is an Iranian movie that was banned in Iran. And again, it's about uh, the abuse of women in Iran. And uh, it's a little a subtitled movie. I think it won the uh, Sundance Film Festival Award, or Best Foreign Film. But it's a powerful movie about uh, the subtle and not so subtle oppression of women in that culture and how these women fight for their identity and the way the rules are bent toward men and away from women and authoritarianism and uh, negative patriarchy. Uh, 
Anyway, that's a, a good little movie I'd recommend you go see. Uh, and I don't only want you to learn this intellectually, I want you to learn it experientially or viscerally. I mean, the things that transform us are the experiences we have in life. And uh, I hope this course is a way of uh, uh, awakening what's going on around you. Uh, this past weekend, uh, we had a you know, flood crisis in uh, our city. And one of the things a friend noted that uh, when the hospitals closed down, and uh, they had no electricity and they had all these patients. They sent word out for the, uh, the hospital staff, sent word out for the Boy Scouts to come down. They needed strong hearts and strong lungs for these Boy Scouts to come and carry these food up and down these stairs for these patients. And uh, my friend uh, pointed out something very interesting. Well, what about the Girl Scouts? They have strong lungs and, you know, strong hearts and are just as capable. But we have this subtle, subtle prejudice, don't we? And uh, you can see it in the media. You can see it. It's in our own psyche, our own Freudian slips, our own attitudes, uh, where we tend to say, well, we need some, someone strong to come and aid and do this. And we immediately think of boys and men when, in fact, we all know that there are young girls, young women are more than capable of helping uh, with activities like that. So... Anyway, just trying to point out and awaken to you to look at the gender-defined uh, issues, gender roles that are defined by our culture that we see all around us. Um, and, and anything you see like that or read in the paper or become aware of, uh, I was at a wedding uh, a month ago in East Texas, and uh, the, the language of the service, and I'm, I honor the the service and the tradition, but the language was a little interesting, uh, rather archaic language and that can be very offensive. In fact, I think it is offensive. When uh, the, uh, the minister was reading from his text, from the scriptures, or whatever, that woman was made from a man using the Genesis text in the Old Testament, woman was made from a man and for a man. And you kind of go, well, yeah, that's pretty heavy stuff. Uh, you know, how does somebody feel like, you know, how does that make a woman feel? Uh, I guess I wonder if he would have said, and a man is made from a woman and for a woman. That might have balanced it out. Uh, and issues like who gives this man away, this woman away to be married to this man, and as if she's some property to be given away. And, you know, these are archaic, traditional values that all have their own proper place and uh, have a sacred underlying message. But as we see an evolution of our consciousness, awareness, um, certainly we have to be aware that um, we set people free to be who they are and not force people to maintain uh, identity roles that, uh, that, that keep us stifled from becoming who we're meant to be. But anyway, those are concepts and ideas and examples that are going on all around. And uh, those are great little exercises for extra credit. And uh, you might keep that in mind. Okay, what I want to do today is uh, a bit uh, finish up talking about the ego development and what that's about. As if anybody knows what all this is about. You know, we're sort of just scratching part of this giant elephant whenever we look at psychology, the human experience, the meaning of life, you know. Uh, but it, it's worth our efforts because we'll, we'll uh, discover things perhaps we didn't know before. Um, one of the things uh, we've been looking at is uh, this uh, birth of consciousness. We talked about ego as this, this organ of decision-making and willpower, and we have this ideal, our persona. In the Freudian model, it's called the superego. And down below the water level, we have this, uh, our soul, which is really the word psyche. It's our true self. It's the real you. Literature calls this many things. It's called the Imago Dei. It's the divine spark. It's uh, 
your potential, um, the God within. You know, but that that there's this whole emergent, emergence that, that we come we come from the unconscious. This is the unconscious here, and up here is what we're aware of, our conscious world. And the whole point is that we come out of this world, we, we come into this world out of the unconscious, we're born into consciousness, and in order to survive in the world, we have to develop an ego. An ego, remember, means I or me. It's not a scary word, it just, just scares people. And having a good ego is an important part of the journey. You can't function and actualize your potential as a person without having a good ego. And, um, and then we, so we, we come into consciousness and to express ourselves, our gifts, our talents to live. And then, you know, when we die, we sort of lo we lose our ego and we slip into the great mystery again. And uh, so w part of what I've been talking about is what happens is ego development. And the ego develops for survival. And uh, the ego develops for... Uh, well, for, it, it develops for survival so that we can stay alive and function in the world. And what the ego does is it will actually leave the true self and it'll do whatever the caregivers say in order to survive. Um, someone said the, the, the great um, first two thoughts a person has is who's in charge and what are the rules? And the ego says, I will do anything to survive, to get approval, to get affection, to get food, clothing, and shelter. And often the, the persona is all culturally based, culturally based. So what the ego does is it adapts. It adapts for survival. And in many ways, it forms its original identity to, to a large degree, not totally, but to a large degree based on what the culture the caregivers demand that we uh, that we do and be in order to survive. And this has tremendous effect on our identity and our uh, our gender identity. Uh, for and and we've looked at this in in the, some of the studies about um, we looked at this last week, last class about the fears that the ego must overcome. Hopefully, I can do this and not be too messy with it. And one of them is the fear of uh, being smothered. And the, the ego's fear that uh, it will be engulfed by caregivers. It adapts uh, to the caregivers, uh, primarily the mother figure. It fears being smothered. It fears being uh, abandoned. Uh, another fear the ego must always deal with is the fear of being attacked. For survival, it, you have to be fear, afraid of that. And most, uh, most men have no idea what it is for uh, women to walk out into a dark parking lot at night, um, even in the daytime, even a well-lit parking lot, and the fear that she has of being victimized by someone's negative projection on her or taking out their aggression or something. But the fear of being attacked is one of the fears the ego must also deal with. A fourth one is the fear of being exposed. I know this is a review from our last class, but I like to jump into it uh, by picking up. And the fear of exposure is that if I, if I express what I really feel, what I really think, my real inner world, that uh, you'll reject me. So... The ego puts all these defenses up, doesn't it? The ego defends itself and often defends itself from its own inner world in order to survive, to deal with fear of being smothered, abandoned, attacked, exposed. And another fear that the ego has to come to terms with is, um, is uh, its uh, destructive instincts. <clears throat> I mean, some of us, we all of us have, have at times have been so mad and angry. We often thought our rage would, you know, it's possible that it could just overtake us or we've been so hurt or wounded that we feel like we'd just be engulfed in our depression or loneliness or 
and and all, you know you you can't help but pick up the newspaper to realize that these destructive instincts uh, burst forth and overwhelm the ego. They, these things, you know, they come out of the unconscious, and uh, as a conscious, alive, whole person, I have to um, monitor these instincts and deal with them appropriately. Um, but these things, these destructive instincts, can overwhelm us and. You see this happening all the time in, in uh, relationships, and in fact, many of the movies are about instinctual instincts that take over, rage and anger and violence, and somehow we project on this and delight in them because it, it's really who we all are. Remember, the media just reflects who we are. And then another one, another fear we deal with is the fear of change. Isn't it interesting? Everybody wants to change, part of us wants to change. But the fear is that if, if I change, will I like myself? If I become, uh, if I change, will others like me? Can I really become myself? Or am I stuck with just being what was put together the first 14 years of life uh, through ego development? And then a seventh one I had, and this is a good, obviously a good test question, is the fear of the unknown. Um, it's the fear of death or the fear of not being. And this fear also, uh, these, these are fears that we constantly have to deal with throughout our whole experience of uh, whether we're conscious or unconscious, these fears, and there's probably there's many more, I'm sure, that uh, are common fears. What's interesting is the fears of all intimacy revolve around these two, don't they? Uh, if I get close, I'm going to lose my identity, fear of being smothered, and if I get my distance, <clears throat> will I be abandoned? And somehow this dance of intimacy <clears throat> between the fear of being engulfed and smothered in a relationship, often uh, people not feeling, uh, having permission to uh, define their own identity because they're so used to being pl played into a role. Um, it, uh, say, the cl classic traditional role, if the woman's the mother and she's going to mother the children and mothers the husband and mothers everyone well then pretty soon the husband can often feel smothered by, by being overly mothered and and he may push for more distance and yet uh, the same woman as she say steps out of her role of primary caregiver and say goes back to school or begins to pursue interests and talents and uh, a, a, a calling a career that heretofore 50 years ago wasn't available to her her fear is that if she pursues her own inner world she might be abandoned because she's no longer caretaking the way she did and uh, you know th this dance of intimacy goes on all the time in all relationships and uh, m much of the uh, existential anxiety that we have as human beings is around the issues can I be close to you and still be me and I cannot be me and still get your love and affection and give love and affection. See, that's the great paradox. I alone must become myself, but I can't become myself alone. I must dare to, uh, to be on my own journey of actualizing and discovering and becoming who all that I'm meant to be in terms of my gender identity, talents, gifts, calling, and help you to become that too. And yet, will you abandon me, or will you stay with me, or will you smother me? And these dynamics are always going on. And the reason I bring it up is because as we look at the transition of gender identity that's going on in our culture, uh, in the area of the personal, individuals, couples, families, we find these, these two primary fears of being smothered and abandoned at the forefront of um, what we have to deal with. Any questions? No, there's no one here. <laughs> Except Javier's back there, but he's not taking this course. Um, okay, so um, so this model sort of works for me. Thank you for fading into that. <clears throat> this model sort of works for me as a way of understanding this. Remember we talked last time is that the three kinds of authority, traditional authority kind of comes out of our cultural ideals. 
and um, rational authority often comes from the ego, scientific empiricism, and unconscious or charismatic authority sort of comes out from something deeper where we get our myths and our stories and we kind of looked at that. Um, we're going to look a little bit at more at that today, <clears throat> what that's about. Now, let's see uh, where we're going to go here. Okay, so we've talked about, I, I want to still put the ego together. And we talked about the ego develops, or, or the ego functions, or for, uh, to orient us uh, to time and space. And, uh, and we talk about getting grounded. I mean, it, it, the, 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 it, having, developing an ego says I'm here in time and history and this is who I am and how I'm functioning and what I need and making it in life. And the second thing is the purpose of the ego is for differentiation, how I'm separate and different. I'm mother, I'm not you, I'm me. Separate, and this we talked about standing on our own feet. See, being grounded, oriented to time and space is how we get that sense of safety and security, as it were, mothering, holding, caring. And then about two years, 18 months, we start separating. And that separateness often creates anxiety. In fact, it does create anxiety. And that pretty much goes with us the rest of our life. In terms of coming in terms with anxiety, and then the third thing is uh, uh, the function of the ego is for um, is to develop an identity, develop an identity through connections, through connections with authority figures. <clears throat> Cool, <clears throat> and uh, we're gonna. I'm gonna look at that um, uh, through authority figures, and th this is uh, this is the ego develops a sense of self consciousness. Uh, I am me, and what it means to be a woman or a man, what it means to be a girl or a boy, and. Uh, uh, it, it develops around these authority figures. Let me let me just uh, jump into something. I don't know if you guys can pan in on this. I found this uh, this weekend in another textbook. Can you guys get closer, a little closer? Is that it? That's it. Oh, wonderful. We might, by Georgia, we might do this. Let me show you some things here that I uh, um, found in this. I thought it was really fascinating. It's kind of a summary of what we've been talking about. But this first aspect of, this says adult gender identity. And it really has, and remember gender identity is a complex web as this looks, but it's, it's somewhat simple if you let me follow through. The first thing is prenatal factors. And this has to do with chromosomes at conception, that's what that says. And then uh, the fetal gonads determining uh, testicles or ovaries determine whether we uh, develop fetal hormones that one that distinguishes male or female in sex organs. See how these prenatal factors? And then the effect of these hormones on the brain, the testosterone, the androgen, the, and how that affects us. But if you'll just follow me, prenatal factors, watch this, factors of infancy and childhood and factors at puberty. So if we're going to determine gender identity, we'll have to include the prenatal factors. That means if we have the two X's chromosome on the 23rd pair or if we have the XY, and depending on what that is, we'll develop male or female sex organs. 
and then we'll have a sex assigned at birth. And see, now that we have the sex assigned at birth, now the factors of infancy and childhood, how that child is reared. And right here, it says rearing as girl or boy. And I put here gender role because gender role is sort of how we are treated by society. Studies show that little girls will be handed dolls and playthings and little boys will be handed, uh, you know, guns and sports equipment and stuff. And gender role is determined by culture uh, in terms of uh, what the culture predisposes the family, the religious world, whatever, predisposes little boys and little girls should do. And they and and the studies tend to show that uh, that our sexual our sexuality our sexual assignment is comes from our chromosomes, but our gender identity is strongly affected by the way we are reared or the way uh, society handles us. And so so here's the sex assigned, and this is how gender rolls from the outside. Remember, nature, nurture, and then the child's own image of body image. And remember, in the textbook, we talked about the Freudian model of penis envy. And uh, it's, it's so interesting to look to think about the way Freud saw uh, women were not defined positively; they were defined as lacking a penis, and how that just fed into the patriarchal world of. Um, the male being dominant, the women having less and being less, and you know he saw that so much of the psychosexual trauma in uh, girls was because they didn't have power and authority of a male, therefore wanting a penis. Which, uh, in the Jungian model, analytical psychology, it sort of acknowledges that Freud was right, but not literally, but more psychologically, that as it were, girls want power too, just like boys want power and need power. Anyway, so prenatal factors, childhood, infancy, and factors of infancy and childhood develop a child's core gender identity. And then when we go over here and we follow the hormones that get set up from the testes, the presence of testicles or, um, or ovaries, <coughs> what happens is these factors at puberty occur. Does anybody find this interesting like I do? Well, there's nobody to say, yes, Dr. Egan, this is fascinating stuff. Uh, so based on the fetal hormones and the hormonal changes at puberty, certain behavioral responses increase sexual interest, physical changes of sex organs in the body. And uh, so this is almost, uh, this is nature, nature kicking in. And probably a lot of these behavioral responses may have to do with nurture or self-discovery or self-expression. And then over here is nurture. The thing I threw in here, which uh, my uh, fellow colleagues in scientific empiricism, which is such an essential way to understand, increase our knowledge and epistemology of discovery, often cringe at the concept of unique archetypal structures because archetypes have a hard time being measured. We're going to look at that today. And part of what I'm going to include in my class is I want to acknowledge what the textbook says and other textbooks say. These chromosomes affect us. Culture affects us tremendously. But there, there tends to be a predisposition archetypally um, that maybe has not been isolated uh, with the chromosomes. There just seems to be something within us that uniquely wants to express itself. And, and it's written in our genes and the mystery, it's somehow our own uniqueness that often can't be measured, but it can be experienced and it can be observed. Uh, one, uh, one article I read the other day was about the junior high student, female student, who was a drummer and uh, played in the per percussion section of her, um, of the band. And 
all the guys totally resented it. And she said, you know, is there anything in a Y, uh, do you have to have a Y chromosome in order to play the drums? And, the, and of course, there are a lot of studies or uh, folklore that say, well, you know, guys are drummers and women are not. And, and yet, who could define why this was for her except maybe some archetypal urge, maybe that's just the nature of who she was and what it meant to be uh, her unique self was that she wanted to play the drums. And maybe that has something to do with her genetic predisposition. Um, maybe it has something to do with the way she was reared, although the, the study didn't say anything like that. But she was born to play the drums, and she has to s soar and, and express herself that way. So anyway, I thought this little model was sort of fun to look at and acknowledge. Um, so these three factors, prenatal factors, factors, of infancy and childhood, factors of puberty, and then I've added uh, unique archetypal structures or factors. as a way of perhaps understanding the gender. And I think you'll like it when we, as I talk today more about it in the next class, as we look at more of these, what these archetypes are about, I think you'll, uh, I think it might make some sense to us. Um, okay. So we got why the ego functions. Now let, let me share a little bit uh, why the ego grows and how it grows. <clears throat> And again, this is uh, uh, the ego grows from three different aspects. One aspect is gratification. When the needs of the ego are satiated, the ego grows. A person gets a sense of self worth. It's uh, gratification is satisfying pain. Uh, through soothing and uh, this is meeting needs to lessen pain and the ego develops from that uh, in other words it's 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 sort of like there's a we're sort of pain avoidant cre avoidance creatures and uh, we can we discover the world is safe and it can be um, uh, it can be trusted the, to the degree the ego is comforted. See, comforted. We were looking at uh, last class about uh, to the degree we have that positive mothering and get our food, clothing, shelter, holding needs met. We sense, tend to grow and have a sense of who we are, um, and it grows. It grows through gratification. The second thing that ego grows around, ego grows around, uh, stimulation. Not just as a child but throughout life, stimulation tells the ego it is, that it exists. Uh, the infant will not prosper if it's not stimulated. Uh, no, no one will prosper without stimulated. You know when they have the little mobiles and the little deal that hangs above the crib, you know, that you can tell art is not one of my favorite things, I mean one of my talents. The uh, little mobile that hangs above the crib and it stimulates the child. See that stimulation awakens, see, it awakens uh, the ego to its environment. So, touching, speaking, uh, reading, playing. Uh, so, whatever stimulates us uh, feeds the ego to keep growing. That's why many. You know, you students, you know, just continuing to learn new ideas, have ideas challenged, question authority, question your own beliefs and concepts. This seems to be 
essential for you to keep growing as a person. Um, you know, the, although we have the ego growing first 14, 20, 21 years, I mean, it somewhat develops its whole life, not, not essentially, but uh, that we continue to need to be stimulated in order to uh, assimilate and accommodate new information to become a more evolved person. So the ego grows around gratification and it grows around stimulation. And the third thing it grows around, which is, will help us understand more about gender identity, it grows around approval. And uh, there's probably, uh, approval says you belong. It says you're, you're wanted. You're okay. <laughs> or as they used to say, add a boy. Add a boy. To be gender fair, add a girl. <laughs> Approval is a sense to be me. I say, it's, it's okay to be me. And how a, uh, a child asks, how approving and accepting is the environment? And the ego uh, uh, discovers that uh, it cannot contain in consciousness what the authorities don't approve of. And let me just kind of slip this right here. The approval part's still there, so let me get a little more room here. Um, in the first uh, seven years of life, approval is around parents. And uh, say from 14, 0 to 7... From 14 to 21, it's around parents and peers. Is anybody making a connection how our gender identity is affected? Because the approval is so important about it's okay to be, that's feminine, that's masculine, that's what boys do, that's what girls do. That our very survival and growth as an, uh, in our development as a human being is around the approval, it's okay to be me. And when the little girl picks up a, you know, a, a hammer and wants to work with the hammer and the parent grabs it away and says, no, don't be playing with that. That's for your brother to play with. And in order to get approval, the carpenter that's in the little girl gets repressed. It gets, it's not okay to want the hammer. It's not okay to want to do sports. It's not okay to want to do things that the family might say, well, no, that's for boys to do. <clears throat> and and um, our, our st the studies, and there's several studies in our text that show that uh, in just the exploration, boys and girls will make a lot of choices for discovering their own inner world and interests. And, uh, and yet the approval or disapproval of the parents can so shape that. Uh, and create identity confusion, gender identity confusion. So, and then from 21, actually to 28, actually 35, this is maybe adolescence, which goes from 14 to about 35 in our culture, it seems these days. It's primarily peers and then the self, your own identity. And and say 25, 28 to 35 and onward, it's the self. In other words, you determine what your identity is, and you determine what you approve of and disapprove of. Uh, I often ask in my counseling office, I'll often ask parents, uh, uh, say a woman comes in, she's 35 or 40, and I'll say, when did you leave home? And she'll say, well, you know, when I left for college or something, and I'll say, well, um, I mean, when did you emotionally need to leave home? When did your mother stop being your mother and you stop being her daughter? When did you stop seeing yourself as someone's child? And more often than not, the answer is, well, she'll always be my mother. And, you know, probably a little trickery of psychology, I guess, but the, uh, look, looking at the double meanings, the point is, oh, well, biologically, of course, she'll always be your mother. But by definition, adults don't have parents. Uh, she can be your former mother uh, psychologically. So we see this evolution of approval or identity formation around the ego growth 
the gratification, stimulation, approval from parents, parents and peers, peers to the self, and ultimately to the self. That's not to say we don't always care what other people think about us or our parents and other authority figures do continue to shape us and form us, but there's an evolution of consciousness to where we determine more our true self. And obviously good parenting, good parenting is acknowledging the self that exists in the child the whole way through. That we don't sort of overly identify a child's uh, gender identity by so defining it out of parents' own neurotic or identity confusion issues um, too early in life. Well, does anybody have any questions? No, you have no questions because nobody hears to ask them. But if I were sitting out there, what question would I be asking? Well, I don't have a question either. So, um, okay, so here's the deal. The deal is what's What's not accepted, does anybody know what happens to that? <laughs> good, quite good answer there. The first answer is I'm talking to myself. This is, you, you know, they say if, uh, if you talk to yourself before you're 40, you're crazy. But if you don't talk to yourself after you're 40, you're crazy. Because we have many selves within. They all want a piece of the action. Uh, but what's not accepted, that we do three things with this, and we'll look at more of this uh, in our second part of the course, um, how we project these things. What we do first is we repress them. We repress what's not accepted. And <clears throat> repress means to put it back. We put it back. That means something that comes up into consciousness Something, uh, something that comes up into consciousness. Uh, for example, uh, let's say it's a, a young boy who wants to play a violin in a musical, and he's in a kind of a gruff, macho, classical, traditional family, macho family, or something. And so his his affinity for art or soft things it comes up, and then the parents say. No, that's not approved of, and it drops back into the unconscious. And then it lies down here, and all kinds of neurosis will happen until that gets attended to. And people have developed complexes around this. Um, see, so it was repressed. That means it came up and got put back down. And, you know, this happens to all of us. Many, many things in life um, growing up get put back. And, and let me say this. It's important to realize that it's not... Everything is meant to be expressed because, uh, you know, you really, you know, you can't go harm other people. And that violent reaction, you have to learn to put that back and find an, another way to deal with those feelings and express them, uh, sublimate them, put that energy elsewhere. So we're not talking about letting the savage banshee warrior out and it's all its madness and narcissistic compulsiveness, impulsiveness. Uh, but, but the things that are not accepted, the things that are not approved of, uh, what's not accepted gets repressed. Uh, let me throw one more in on repression would be, um, uh, say, feelings. That, uh, you know, boys don't cry and uh, boys can't uh, have feelings. Be a man. You know, the kid's six years old. <laughs> You're the man of the house now, son. And, you know, it's just a child full of feelings and strengths and weaknesses, vulnerabilities, like every human being is. But that child has said, now, don't cry. Hold those feelings in. And so those feelings get held back, emotions, feelings, for years and decades. And, and who will ultimately have to deal with this? Well, a lot of people, um, including one's lover, spouse, children, way down the line, things that get repressed back. Um, and so that person will have to learn again, sort of reparenting, which in psychotherapy, that's what we do is we help people learn a second time how to be a more whole person. 
and express one's uh, unique life and the, the breadth and depth of, one, of the human experience. Okay, the second thing that happens <coughs> of what's not acceptable is uh, it is suppressed. Suppressed. <coughs> and that means uh, never allow it up. It means to hold it down. Let's see. <coughs> Actually, the word depression means to hold down. But often depression comes from a suppression or a repression, all these pressings going on. Uh, but a suppression is to never allow it up. And, and uh, you know, how many a, a child growing up in a family understanding gender identity, gender role expectations, um, learn quickly not to, to suppress certain things, not express feelings of anger, rage, power, authority, not express tenderness, gentleness, um, uh, in, in different kinds of feelings. So things get repressed. Uh, I mean, they stay suppressed. Uh, it would be, in a sensational example, it'd be the child who sees, you know, uh, one of their parents having an affair with the neighbor in bed, and that affects the child. The child can never say anything about that for fear of not being accepted, for fear of being hurt. And so the child never says, of course, the child might say something about it and then is told to push it back. Uh, a lot of... Uh, sex, sexual abuse that goes on, uh, children don't express it to anybody. And um, myself, many therapists over the years, sometimes we're the first person an adult will tell about their own abuse as a child. And uh, it, it makes me so sad to think that a child could be abused sexually, emotionally, spiritually, verbally, physically, some way and never be able to tell anybody what hurts and how and the need to uh, to get support and uh, that happens a lot more than people think for we all carry lots of things under the surface some things that have come up and we we're told to put back down but many things we were just told to repress and, I mean to suppress and keep hidden and keep down and the and the effect of that is we're not real people we're pretentious people we're plastic people we we present what people want instead of who we are. And, and that's not to say we don't have, need to have a mask and a role and a way to present ourselves. But if you can't, <clears throat> if you can't express what you're really feeling inside uh, over time, well, you'll have what we call a split psyche. Uh, you'll not be a whole person. Okay, so here it is. What we don't repress and we don't suppress, what do we do with it? The third thing, and this is where we see the abuse of um, so much of what goes on in the world, how we treat one another, and that is we project it. And project means to throw it out. See? It becomes a shadow. Things that are intolerable to the ego get projected out and we, we project onto others and many people would say that some of the greatest uh, I mean all of life is projections because the things I don't deal with come to terms with except the confusion the doubt the insecurity the passion the hurt the woundedness the gift the talent the creativity of life it all gets thrown out on others and uh, it can get thrown out on our children, our, our lovers, our friends, our enemies. We project out. And so a person who, say, uh, a person who's, who has um, difficulty accepting someone else's gender identity or gender role, uh, maybe someone who's not found those archetypal things inside themselves. Uh, we'll look at what archetype means in just a second. Um, but if you want to learn about yourself, one of the greatest ways to learn about yourself is to make a list of three people you don't like. I've said this before, and three people you do like. 
and then write three characteristics about each of those three you don't like and three characteristics about each three you do like. So you got nine over here and nine over here. My gosh, 18. And if you will do some reflecting and digging, you'll discover that all those things that you don't like out there and you do like out there are in yourself. And the question is, I've got to come to accept, attend to, acknowledge, grieve, embrace those things that I don't like because there's actually gold in those hills. For example, my insecurity is where I can get my tenderness. And those gifts and talents and strengths I see in others, I can find in myself. But, you know, I may have to go to school. I may have to go learn and study and, and invest in a talent rather than just project it onto someone else. Uh, but nevertheless, the whole point of this uh, instruction today is about ego development and how the ego and how we see ourselves growing up is so affected by the approval of other people. Our parents, our peers, um, our God images, that would be, should throw that in there someplace, uh, that determine who we are and what we're about. And you'll know in, the, in your text uh, on the chapter that, uh, the chapter on, uh, the origin of gender stereotypes in mythologies and religion, uh, which is chapter two. As you read through that, you'll see how so many of the uh, of our gender uh, of the uh, gender identity of both men and women was shaped and conformed by uh, mythology and rules. And, and by mythology, I don't mean that it's not true. Of course, myths are not fact; they are true but these powerful symbols of way we understand life and uh, find meaning through religious faith. And, you know, just reading that and thinking about how we shape and form our gender identity through, cult through culture and religion. In fact, one of the reasons I picked this book out is I thought that chapter in and of itself uh, perhaps helps us to see some of the deep rootedness of permission or non-permission that we have to develop our own identity. Um, certainly no one is raised in a vacuum and all our culture, religious traditions have tremendous, remember under the traditional authority, have important uh, place in defining who we are and how we behave. But that chapter, it's a way to look at um, how men and particularly women are uh, treated and uh, are identified in their gender. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll get back to this uh, at another point, but I just wanted to, once again, push over here, let me go through this again, is uh, the ego grows around having its needs met, gratific gratification, soothing, uh, it, one develops a sense of confidence and trust in the universe uh, through having its needs met, food, clothing, shelter, hugging, stuff like that. Uh, and then stimulation, uh, reading, playing, touching, uh, ha having the, the ego awakened through encounters with the environment. And, and clearly, um, I was reading it the other night. I don't know where it was, but they found, uh, I'll get this and show it to you maybe next class. They found that uh, families who are willing to have a broad view of gender identity for their children and expose boys and girls, children, to uh, just the breadth and depth of the human experience of things that are normally stereotypical for boys or girls uh, actually helps the ego to develop. Uh, f families that have rigid, narrow definitions of what it means to be a girl or a boy, male or female, often provide little stimulation and children don't grow in their ego development. This may be stretching it a bit, but you know, it's just for purposes of thinking. Uh, um, well, I'll give you an example. This was, uh, I, I took this, uh, my first, uh, can you put it on this camera? Hit the button. Can I tell a story? Emily. Ah, there we are. Okay, good. Uh, sooner or later she'd get there, I know. 
Um, I remember when uh, I decided to go back into graduate school after my uh, bachelor's degree in business administration, and then I went to seminary, and then I was thinking about graduate work in counseling because I was working with high school students and families. The first, one of the first, first courses I took as a post-baccalaureate to just sort of plunge in to see if this is where my interests were uh, was in um, a course in child development. And I remember the professor talked about one um, co-ed from West Texas who had been you know, salutatorian and, you know, cheerleader and just very successful um, academically and socially and intellectually, everything, in the high school. And she went off to University of Texas or Texas Tech. And she wasn't there six weeks before she, uh, you know, was having problems drinking and skipping classes and went into deep depression. They took her to the university counseling office and she began to do some therapy and try to get at what is going on and as it turned out what had happened is uh, uh, one of the little uh, uh, relationships uh, little special things she had with her mother which seemed innocuous um, was uh, that her mother loved to they'd go shopping and buy her clothes and her mother loved to put her clothes out in the morning you know, pick her clothes out. So she woke up, the mother said, well, wear this and wear this. And this just became, I can't believe a high school student was sort of put up with this, but this was the nature of their relationship. Um, and so what happened is, uh, so she was used to mother picking out her clothes. Well, she got off to college, and one of the most fundamental things you have to do to start your day is to wake up, clean up, decide what you're going to put on. And this young co-head who had been so successful in so other ways was stifled in her ability to make a decision. And we'd say she had real sort of ego, uh, poor ego structure because she couldn't even make a decision and feel confident about what she put on. And um, that her therapy was all about working through that and because see, she'd never developed her own confidence about that. Ego development is around getting your needs met, it's around stimulation, making choices, and it's around approval. And so with this co-ed, you know, obviously she decided what to put on based on what mother said, and she, you know, colluded with the game. But this had tremendous effect to her when she got off to college because she couldn't even make a decision. So this third thing here of uh, approval and then what's not approved of gets repressed, suppressed, or projected onto others on our ego identity. <clears throat> okay, now let's talk a little bit about Archie types. <laughs> um, actually, bear with me just a second. And um, th this this sounds like I'm going in a different direction, but I'm not. I'm just I want to I want to talk about what archetypes are, and how they affect us, and uh, something that uh, in my terms of uh, reading about gender and gender identity, um, there was an aspect of that sort of a missing factor and. And that is, um, there, there, uh, A R C H E, arch, my son calls them archetypes, archetypes. Arch means ancient, actually, it means rule too, R U L E, imprint. An archetype is an ancient imprint. And uh, in an interesting article I found by um, Thomas More, let me find these other archetypes. Yes, here they are. Um, he, 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 let, let me just do this. What, what, well, this, is what's, this is what's sort of fun about this. Yeah, if I can keep this going. These are two different people. Um, what, what there's really three levels of consciousness. There's the conscious level for all of us. There is what's called the 
personal unconscious for all of us. That would be my unique uh, issues that I've repressed, that I've suppressed, things that I project out. My own personal wounds, my talents, my gifts, your own personal wounds from your family of origin, your DNA, your genetic makeup. That's the, uh, th this is something that uh, analytical psychology or Jungian psychology uh, addresses. I think that was probably one of the geniuses of Jung. And it's really interesting when we look at this in terms of gender identity. And then down below, if it's possible, is what's the, called the collective. And collective means group unconscious. And, you know, if we could make these waves, uh, make these icebergs, as it were, um, you know, if we could just make, I guess we can, if I could do like this. And, and these are all unique individual, oops, unique individual people in the way they consciously express their life and they have a personal unconscious. We'd have to say that there's, you know, each wave is unique, but the ocean of the archetype is the same for everyone. As it were, this is the water beneath the surface. And there are these common themes that every human being has, and that's what an archetype is. Uh, I mean, it, at least nowadays you can hear fifth and sixth graders talk about the unconscious. And the unconscious is the, the part of ourself we don't know, but the part of ourself that is always trying to express itself. And um, these are, these are the, this is the realm of archetypes. And archetypes are uh, what Freud would call drives for his drive theory. Archetypes would be, the poet might call them longings. <clears throat> the scientists might call them instincts. That we have these predisposed, there's a dimension of the human psyche that is the same for every one of us. There's a dimension, as it were, of the ocean, if each wave is unique. But there's a dimension of all under the sea of life that is the same. And these, these drives, these longings, these instincts, these common aspects to the human experience that are innate, that are, that are part of our DNA, that are psychologically, there's a dimension that's exactly the same for all of us. It's exactly the same. These are archetypes. They're involuntary needs we all share. Involuntary needs. Um, these are uh, predisposed patterns of human behavior. Predisposed patterns. I'll explain about that. Let me see. These come from eons of human experience. And as I explain it, you'll kind of get it because it's, uh, it's really foundational. See, and, and what's difficult is it's difficult to prove these predisposed patterns, but you can see them in mythology, story, in all of human experience. Uh, and, and Jung saw these, Carl Jung saw these themes are these images that were common in literature and common everywhere. Uh, these themes and images that are, are uh, ubiquitous, they're part of the human experience. Uh, and uh, let me see another place. They are imprinted in the human psyche, these predisposed patterns of behavior, these deep longings, these instincts, these common human expressions, images, expressions. So let me sort of define it. We, we might uh, have a cardinal, um, male and female cardinal, have a nest in a ficus tree at my house. And the instinct to build a nest is, lies within the egg of the bird. 
that's, in the, as far as I know, these birds don't go to school and learn how to build nests. There's an instinct to build a nest. And, but how the nest is built would be the archetype. Because something within them knows how to, where to put the twigs and how to shape the twigs for safety and security with the wind and the rain. Then how to, uh, often you'll see them, <coughs> the birds will go and you know, find a dog and pick that uh, fur and make a soft place. Well, how does a bird know to do that? Well, instinctually, it knows that building a nest is essential for the, uh, to keep the species alive. But how does it know how to build it? Well, there's some programmed blueprint pattern within that knows just how to do that. That would be an archetype. So we would have to say, we would say then that there's archetypes for being a mother, that every human being, be it male or female, knows about mothering. Every human, male or female, knows something of fathering. The list I gave you, that you've all taken that little test where you look at the little wheel, and that's trying to affirm some of these archetypal energies that are in all of us. There's an archetype for masculinity and femininity in all human expression. Uh, the seeker, the lover, the destroyer, the caregiver. Remember the list I gave you and you all are hopefully looking at as we're talking right now? Um, the innocent, the orphan, the fool, uh, uh, the ruler, and uh, the, the book the book that I'm using with, uh, with her permission is, uh, or that I got a lot of it from, was called Awakening, Awakening the Heroes Within by Carol Pearson, 12 Archetypes to Help Find Ourselves and Transform Our World. And uh, that she, I called her a while back, and she told me I could use that wheel and for this purpose of the class. But this is the book that is, for those of you that want to learn more about your archetypes and which ones are manifested and which ones are, are uh, still growing. Um, <clears throat> so these archetypes are these predisposed patterns, these, uh, these divine imprints, these uh, uh, ancient imprints. They're, uh, somebody called them raw, uninitiated nature. You know, there's, uh, uh, wait, raw, uninitiated, uninitiated nature, unsullied <coughs> by human culture. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Raw, uninitiated nature, unsullied by human culture. Which means it seems to be these predisposed uh uh, images and symbols that lie within us that somehow know uh, how to deal with sexuality and how to deal with money, to find the warrior within, that assertive part, to find the seeker within. The, uh, and, and see, art and myth and story all talk about these archetypes. And in fact, if, if, we, if we didn't have archetypes, if we didn't have these ancient imprints, we couldn't even have a conversation. For example, if, if you're out here walking across campus and you see out in the middle of this field this, uh, uh, a child, a little baby, say, you know, six weeks old or, you know, just lying there crying, there's something in all of us would identify with that and would rush to aid this child because it's archetypal. We see the abandoned. We see the orphan. We see... We can all identify because we've all have that experience in our own life. We've all been abandoned and orphaned and without care, and uh, we all at times need support. But we would rush to the aid of this child because there's something within us that connects with this. You, you can't tell a story without honoring archetypes, these common themes, the theme of the hero, the one that charges off into battle. I don't know what they are, but someone once said there's only four major themes in all of literature. And these stories just repeat themselves. One of them would be the person born with huge obstacles and they overcome the obstacles and make something or life. Um, uh, another one would be, you know, the person that's born in wealth and affluence and success and becomes hubris and self-centered and they have to lose it to find their soul and become humble. 
but you find these same themes, and this is what we're attracted to in story and relationships uh, are these archetypal themes. Um, and these, so these affect our concept of gender identity, uh, these archetypes. Now, one of the things that Thomas More put out, uh, or wrote out in an article, and, and this sound may sound like double talk, but just stay with me, because I think it's an interesting way to address the issue of gender, is that gender is one of the grand metaphors for the human condition. And for the nature of the cosmos, he says, used by visionaries and poets in all places and all times. Like all metaphors, gender participates in the concrete reality that gives rise to the image, differences between men and women. However, it takes a poetic sensibility to appreciate the metaphor. And the metaphor is primary. Without a taste for image, the mind slips into literalism. Not catching the poetry and gender, we tend to place all our gender talk into actual men and women. So that no matter how hard we try to resolve the war of the sexes, antagonism and polarization remain.